Good morning, everyone. And Laura, thank you very much for the ride. I much appreciate it. Um, I'll bring you back, too. Thank you. That's what <laughs> I won't tell everybody where you parked when you drop me off. Um, secrets that we have, as old friends often do. Um, and Gail, thank you so much for reaching out and inviting me here to your I. Um, I'm thrilled to be here this morning and to be part of your visioning process and to uh, learn from all of you uh, about what you're thinking. Um, as Laura mentioned, I'm working on a bunch of different things, but in some respects, to me, the most important aspect of uh, what I'm working on in research and in uh, administration at Harvard is rethinking our learning communities broadly, rethinking um, the way in which we are uh, trying to redesign our library system, um, but also how we're thinking about pedagogy and research and how those things actually all fit together. So I think the frame that you have established for this 2020 visioning process is completely perfect. Um, it seems to me that the four questions that you're asking after this uh, um, plenary session are awesome, and I'll hit on some aspects of all of them as we go. Um, but I think uh, fundamentally, um, this is a conversation that can't just happen at one school. This is fundamentally a conversation that has to happen across many universities. And um, in particular, I think doing it in this way where we're affirmatively trying to chart a future, affirmatively trying to figure out what are the future of our libraries, what are the future of our classrooms, what's the future of our research institutions broadly. Um, so the invitation from Gail was one that I couldn't imagine uh, not taking up. Good morning, sir. How are you? Um, so I actually start in my own thinking about this question of learning communities by looking at this image. Um, I direct a library, so I love having an image collection that you can pull fun things from. Um, you have no reason to know what this is, but this is the personal study of Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who was one of our graduates and a professor at Harvard Law School before going to the Supreme Court. Um, and this was his study, his personal study in Washington, D.C. when he was on the court. Um, and you can disagree with some of his opinions and some of what he did, but overall, he was totally brilliant and he broke open the field of law in lots of important ways. Um, and this image to me uh, is evocative of a really attractive teaching and learning space, an, an environment where I wanna sit and try to think great thoughts. I am no Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. by any stretch of the imagination, but this to me is an inspiring environment, a place to sit um, and a place to learn. Um, but I'm also completely aware at this moment that for our students, this is not so obviously the place to sit and learn, right? Um, we are uh, teaching a group of students, um, and to some extent ourselves as faculty, where we don't necessarily sit in a dedicated learning space like this, a beautiful environment, where we look to things on the wall, which in some cases actually are social signals, and in fact might be more props in some environments than actual uh, learning objects. Um, I know from my own students that our mm -hmm. library is completely full all the time, our law library. It's a big library and it's totally full. Um, students are there elbow to elbow, so much so during exams that we have to keep out the undergraduates, much to the chagrin of the FAS dean. I know your arts and sciences dean is here. I met her earlier. Um, so it's, it's full, but the students are not. I've never once seen a student do the following thing, which is walk up to a stack, pull a book down, and open it. Not once in four years of being a library director. It's just not the pattern of what our students are doing. It's not to say students don't read books. I'll get to that in a minute. But in terms of the pattern of what they're doing in these spaces, is they're there because it's a social space to study. It's a quiet, contemplative space. It has good Wi-Fi. They have their laptops there. Now, they also have case books there. In my case, um, the students have uh, their law case books. So they're, they're using physical text because they like to underline and highlight and so forth. Um, but it's really fundamentally different, I think, than sitting alone in solitude in a space where you've brought all the knowledge to you in terms of how they're learning. So it seems to me the challenge for us as we're visioning 2020 in institutions like URI and Harvard is to think through what affirmatively do we want? How do we want to replace that kind of learning environment, whether it's in the context of a uh, library or uh, other kinds of learning spaces? Um, so my research in this area has been focused mostly on kids. I've been looking at the question of how young people, particularly those somewhere between 13 and 22-ish uh, in different uh, slices, uh, spend their time and, and make the argument that both the media that they're using and they themselves, in a sense, are born digital. These are kids who were born in an era where they didn't know something that was before this digital era. So they didn't have a sense of the analog world that we lived in before. Um, it's not to say that they do everything digitally, um, but they do a lot of things digitally. Um, I think one way to think about it is the amount of time they spend connected to these devices. When we ask kids about their way in which they are 
um, going through life and accessing information, um, they almost always tell us they have some internet connected device on their body at that moment. And I find even for myself that if I don't have it, I feel disconnected or something, right? I'm lost if I don't have it. So one of the key things is this incredibly connected life that they have and the extent to which they are almost always engaging with information in one another through these means. I think it's good and bad in lots of ways. I have um, criticisms of it, to be sure. Um, but one, I think, important thing is that um, even during interstitial moments, even sitting on a bus or waiting for a class to start, uh, we all probably were doing it. I know that the vice provost was reading the New York Times as she was waiting uh, for this to start. We all spend these interstitial moments learning in these ways. So it's just a very different environment, I think, than one where we went to special purpose built learning environments at special moments to do our learning. It's not to say we don't do that too, but there's a very different sense of connectivity. Um, and it's not particularly evenly distributed. I think one of the big themes you're going to hit in one of your breakouts is this idea about digital literacies. So one of the things we found from this research is that these kids who are in uh, the kind of cohort we're studying have huge variability in terms of their digital um, abilities, their digital literacies. So it ranges from kids who are very naive about these technologies to kids who are very sophisticated. Um, and one of the things that the studies show consistently, our studies and others, is that it breaks down along socioeconomic lines. So there's a very strong SES skew to the most sophisticated to naive. So just as we think, that these are born digital or digital native kids, we have to be really aware that it's not evenly distributed. That in fact, the students who are coming to us have a wide range of these skills. And if we're not actually bringing people up that um, ladder, we're actually potentially driving um, further um, divisions within society. So I think when you focus on literacies, not treating everybody who comes into the environment um, as uh, the same uh, is a really important. Um, and last, I think it's really important to recognize uh, the extent to which these digital literacies matter according to lots of different disciplines. So I would bet that in the pharmacy school and in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and um, in you know, your new chemistry building, there are different ways in which digital literacies are going to matter. Um, one of the things that I've found in our work to rethink the Harvard library system is how differently the different disciplines think about digital materials and digital learning. So I suspect you see this too within your um, system. Uh, very much uh, we see a divide between those who are doing the harder sciences who basically say we want nothing in our libraries but electronic journals. We see the data of circulation going unbelievably far down. Um, whereas in the humanities and uh, in some of the other parts of arts and sciences, there's still a huge reliance on the text and the book. So I think as we look out into the future, we also have to recognize that not only is it not evenly distributed among kids, it's not evenly distributed among disciplines. And how we approach it can't be a one-size-fits-all thing at this moment of transition. Um, so why is this important? I think it just means that we have to be researchers and scholars about this. We have to be serious about breaking down and segmenting our approaches, um, whether we're thinking about the library or the teaching environment in this 2020 frame. Maybe everything will converge, um, but I'm not convinced that's uh, entirely so. Um, and I think the other piece, just to um, be uh, honest about it, is that it's not just kids who are experiencing this change. Um, we know absolutely that our president carries a Blackberry, right? Um, we all carry it. I still can't get it out of my hand. I don't know what, quite why I'm holding it like this. Um, and of course, we're modeling these behaviors all the time. Um, I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, and I realized the other day I was in the um, living room and I was sending an email to my wife who was in the kitchen. I realized, oh my goodness, this is really bad, and this is really modeling for our kids in terms of how they do things. Um, and uh, you know, they are always trying to slap the Blackberry away when it's, uh, when it's in my hand. Um, so I think it's important to break down the divide also along age lines. There are um, absolutely just as many people doing sophisticated work using digital technologies and digital literacies who are on faculties and um, who are in our graduate um, uh, programs. Um, I'm not talking about the downsides of the digital age today, but if you look at problems like privacy, adults are just as dumb as kids in terms of leaving too much information online, particularly on dating sites. I can fetch a whole riff on that later, but uh, I think it's important not to sort of fall into the myth of the digital native, the fact that it's only kids who are sophisticated and all the kids are the same. We actually have to be more sophisticated about it than that. Um, this was uh, a uh, just a further note, um, it, I cut it off on the bottom just because of where it goes, but it says where the cool kids hang out. This was an image of uh, our President Barack Obama when he was at the Harvard Law School um, and he was a big library user, so we uh, like to promote, <laughs> promote that on, on the side. Okay, so looking ahead, 
Um, that's one set of, uh, of opportunities and challenges is the extent to which um, the digital age has a series of different ways in which kids approach these technologies and adults too. Um, but I think it's super important that we go forward recognizing that uh, no school, not the richest schools um, and not uh, any other schools has more money to deal with these issues than before. We are at a moment where we have to make hard choices and often those hard choices come between the analog and the digital. So um, there are many ways, I think, in which this plays out, at least in my world in libraries. Um, one of the problems is that we have a split between um, faculty sometimes wanting hard copies of things and students wanting the same things as electronic copies, right? Um, we can't go to publishers and buy both. We don't have the option of getting an increase from our dean or our president of 50% just to buy things in both of these formats. Um, at the same time, of course, publishers are gouging us. I'm sorry if there are any publishers in the room, but they are. Um, there's consolidation and price rises that are way above inflation. Um, we had one of our vendors in the law world who came to us a couple of years ago. It was actually during the horrible downturn year of 2008. Um, and they said, we would like a price increase of 44% for exactly what we gave you last year. So, no, it's just it can't work, right? That is a totally unsustainable world. Um, so we have to make hard choices. I think for us at Harvard, our reaction to this has been to say, we have historically had a view that what a library did was to collect everything, the scholarly record as much as possible in physical format and bring it to 02138, our zip code, right? And have it there for researchers. We no longer can afford to do that. Nobody can afford to do that. And I think we have to give up on the idea that libraries are only about huge collections of materials and the only place you can get it and focus instead on a principle of access. A principle that said, our students or our faculty need access to the materials to do their scholarship and their teaching, but we may or may not have it. So it's ILL, interlibrary loan on steroids, right, is the way to think about this. We need lots of ways to be cooperative, to be collaborative in ways that we haven't before. We at Harvard haven't played nicely in all of these respects in the past, um, but we are much more so. Um, but I, I note this just to say, it's, the answer here is not just figure out how to do all these new digital things in addition to our um, physical things, the things we've always done. That's not plausible. We have to be honest enough and courageous enough to give up stuff that we've done in the past and replace it with the good stuff while also realizing in the digital age there are new problems that crop up. Digital literacies is a new problem to address in some respects. It's the same uh, teaching of analysis and getting to quality information, but it's something that does require some different skills to teach it well and so forth. So uh, get, this is against a backdrop of uh, a difficulty, I admit, um, financially. Um, another way in which there's a difficulty, I think, in this visioning process is recognizing that the amount of material and the scope of scholarship is only increasing. I'm sure this is true for you, or I know it's true at Harvard. Um, the two things that the dean of every uh, law school, anyway, talks about is how interdisciplinary and how international the faculties are, how global it is, right? These are wonderful, wonderful things for scholarship and wonderful for teaching and wonderful for the world. Um, but the problem is, from a libraries and a teaching perspective, is that means we need more materials, right? We need access to much more. So um, getting access to the burgeoning uh, world of Chinese law in this particular case, um, much less ensuring that across the disciplines we're not dropping balls, that we're not um, not collecting at the interstices between, say, law and social science or um, dentistry and medicine and so forth, these places where so much work is going on, we have to think really differently, I think, about how we collect and how we provide access. So this is yet another pressure, I think, in favor of uh, rethinking uh, from the ground up. Um, and I think adding to this challenge is the fact that we haven't totally figured out our own pathways to learning. I don't think we've figured out all the pathways we want to give students to how they get to information and how they ought to learn. Um, this is really a plea for thinking seriously about how cognition works, how learning works, how we present information. Um, when I came to the Harvard Law School library, I was not a librarian, um, and I had the great, great honor to take on this job, but I had the advantage of being a rookie where you can come in and just ask the really dumb questions. So the first thing I did was I met with each of the 100 people who work in this law library, um, and I just found out what they did. And it turned out at the end of that, with 100 people, how many people do you think were focused on our website, presenting information through the web? One is a great guess. It was one third of one FTE, okay? One third of one FTE out of 100 people were focused on the website. And everybody was saying, we need more, we need to focus more. Um, but then I went to the students, and you survey the students and talk to the students and focus group them and say, how many of you 
on a daily basis come through our virtual front door versus our physical front door. And more than half of the time, our students were coming through our virtual front door. They were coming to the website. They were getting e-journals. There really are, in our field, three kind of electronic databases that serve most of the needs of our students. Not to say paper and journals, other things don't matter, but it's the predominance of the usage was in one area, and yet our resource allocation a couple years ago, our HR, uh, was one-third of one FT. We are so out of whack in this space that we absolutely have to start from scratch. We have to have a new whiteboard approach, I think, to thinking through how we are staffing these learning institutions because what the other option is we add one person here or there, right? We, we say we're creating a new digital position, and that's great. We should do that. Um, but that's not the end game. It can't be that when we have one free FTE, we kind of stick one person over there to do digital initiatives or digital scholarship or whatever. That's not going to work. It's out of scale. It's out of whack. And it causes confusion, right? We haven't yet linked up, I think, the virtual and the physical in ways that our students can understand. So this is a side elevation, a picture of the building I work in called Langdale Hall. Um, and I like this image as a provocation, too. Um, because it reminds me that when we're building learning environments like the building we're in here, um, you presumably start with an architect, right? You have a bunch of students and a provost maybe and some faculty who sit down with an architect and say, this is the learning environment we want to create. So in this case, in the middle is our library and there are classrooms on either side and some offices and so forth for faculty. Um, and you have a drawing, right? You have a scheme and you think through the architecture of this space that you're creating. It strikes me that we have not yet done this work for the information age. We have not yet thought through the architecture of the learning environment that joins the virtual and the physical, much less looks at the virtual itself. The virtual is just happening. It's just burgeoning, right? And we still have these buildings that were designed for the physical space. Um, but this, I think, is really a challenge when so much of the learning is happening in this other space. It's connected to the physical. We need to figure out those connect points. It's not um, disembodied. Um, but we need to rethink this connection. And to me, it's a process of doing a design charrette. We need to find the way to have information architects and physical architects and the teachers and students in a room. So this I commend to you uh, what you are doing because I think you guys are embarking on exactly the design charrette that you have to do to envision this from the ground up as something that connects the virtual and the physical. Um, and I think uh, this is the right place to start. Uh, okay, so um, what are some of the approaches one might take against this very long and complex backdrop? Um, one of the jobs I have at Harvard is on our new Harvard Library Board. So uh, here's one of our many problems is we have 73 different libraries. So the investment in libraries per se is $170 million a year at Harvard and so there are 1,000 people who do it in 73 distinct libraries. That is great in terms of investment, fabulous in terms of investment. The deans are terrific to do that. Um, but it's crazy in terms of organization. We have many, 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 many too many chiefs and we're not particularly well coordinated. And one of the things we've not been able to do well is to have a common strategy, to say this is where we're going as a library system. We've had lots and lots of little strategies that have gone on um, uh, independently. So uh, one of my jobs is to co-chair strategy and innovation, the um, group that is within the university trying to figure out how do we direct this um, very large library system in some particular areas that will help to build this future as part of this visioning. So I'm going to play out a few of the things that we're working on. This is not um, meant to be the right prescription for any other institution, but just to give you some of the areas where we are uh, pushing ahead. Um, the first one, just to go back to the point about the kids and the teachers, is being very, very careful to keep studying the people we work with. So we keep asking through surveys and focus groups consistently, how is your learning changing? We want to know a ton about what the format preferences are, how people are getting information, how they are failing to get information, and so forth. So part of this campaign, this doesn't sound strategic or innovative maybe, um, but is to be really good social scientists about this and to be consistently asking this question. So just as one um, small example, I was describing to you the example of the law students who um, don't tend to take the law books off the shelf. Um, all the same, we have been asking our students in, uh, in this particular field and others too um, about their format preferences every year. Um, and when you ask them about uh, audio files or about video or about journals or whatever, and newspapers, they always say digital, right? It's, that's plain. Um, but the one anomaly is when it comes to regular old books. So not so much the, um, uh, the books that journals come in because that's, uh, they want those electronically. But when it comes to a monograph, just a kind of a, uh, 
uh, or a novel or something. Um, what do you think the skew is, the split, in terms of wanting it in a digital format versus in a physical format if they have to choose for students? What's the guess? 60 40, which way? Book. Preference for the book. Yeah. Other guesses? 80 20. 80 20, which way? Book 80. Book 80. So it's in, right in between the two. I understand it's different. So I'm saying in law, in our particular field, it's 70% prefer the book of our students and 30% want, would prefer the ebook. Um, and when we ask them about the casebook, they're about the same, but then they say, well, you don't give us good casebooks, so we, we want it. So if we gave them better things, we, they would go for it. I, I mention this only because it's about, the numbers actually are relatively similar for students and um, for grown-ups. And often when you, <laughs> when you ask, um, when you ask adults um, in a focus group setting after you've, um, uh, after you've done the survey, why? Um, they often have some variant of the three Bs, the bed, the bath, and the beach, right? That's why you like the sort of tactile form of the book. Um, and students say roughly the same thing. So there's actually more correlation when it comes to reading and format um, than one would have thought. So as we hurdle toward you know, digital formats in all these ways, we also have a sense that people prefer, and maybe, maybe it has something to do with learning, we're not sure yet, um, prefer the physical in some cases. And you're quite right that I teach this semester in the design school as well. Those design students want nothing but physical books. Why? Because you know they're big format images, right? They, it doesn't help them to have it on an iPad. So it does matter a lot, discipline specific, which was my earlier point. Um, okay, so one is really paying close attention to our users as the um, habits change, but not guessing, actually trying to get the data. Um, two, and I won't go too far into this, but is really rethinking our collection development strategies. As I mentioned before, our heuristic before, uh, in years past, was simply to buy everything, basically buy everything that we could. Um, that was a myth. We never really could buy everything, but that was sort of more or less the idea. Um, and we wanted the biggest collection, the biggest kind of stack of stuff, and we competed on the basis of collection. No more. So yes, we want to have the best collection in many respects in terms of being able to provide fast access to things. But the idea is not simply to beat Yale or beat whomever else because we have a higher stack of books. Um, we know that only one or two percent of what we in fact have in the collection ends up circulating, right? It's a very small percentage of what we buy uh, people end up using. Um, and we know there are lots of things that people want, data sets and other materials that they really want and really would use immediately that we don't get for them. Um, so this is just an image that I've created to um, have a visual of our emerging collection development um, uh, uh, plan. And the way of thinking about it is, on the one hand, to think about what are unique and rare materials? What are things that only we have? Those are the things where we have a complete permanent commitment to having them in physical um, format, to digitizing them, making them freely available as much as we can. But that's kind of the traditional collect it and have it kind of stuff. On the other end of the um, spectrum, uh, where it says temporary, uh, we're increasingly saying we're not collecting that stuff. So an example in my field, and again, it's discipline specific, but I think you'll have analogs um, in your own field, is the laws of the Swiss cantons. We used to buy all the laws of the Swiss cantons and bring them to Cambridge, Massachusetts. And what would happen is they would come into our basement, they would be stamped, and they would be sent out to our depository, 26 miles away, never to be touched again, right? And the scholars who are working on the laws of the Swiss cantons are getting them on a perfectly good website that the Swiss are keeping up with real efficiency and consistency, okay? So the idea of our spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, much less people time, much less you know, cataloging effort and so forth, and storage space on the laws of the Swiss cantons when they're perfectly well cared for in the European Union, um, we've quit collecting those. Now, that may seem like an easy case, um, but I think there are more of those cases than we think in the library world. And my view is we don't have a choice. On that end of the spectrum, we have to be more collaborative. We have to expect that other people are going to be doing more collecting. We have to find faster and better ways to share, um, and there are challenges to that. But I think breaking down the idea that what it means to collect is to have it physically and to go much more to an access model is crucial. Um, and I just want to say even schools that have traditionally been in that full, like bring it here, uh, model, uh, it's not that anymore. Um, okay, one of your uh, uh, second series of uh, breakouts, the um, uh, breakout number three at 1040 is about open access and um, subscription. So I mentioned this serials crisis that we have. I don't know if it's true in your library system, but it's something like 80-20 in our library system in terms of expenditures between serials and... Uh, 90-10? Okay, very helpful. So in any event, it's a big, it's a big um, skew, and, and to the extent that that's a sort of ever-rising cost, and one where our, it feels like the job of librarians is what do we cancel when it comes to serials, as opposed to you know, how can we get 
um, uh, knowledge to our users, um, I think there has to be a number of different kinds of interventions. One of the difficulties is, as the buyers of this information, we too rarely have a plan B, right? So we go into these negotiations, and we know that our faculty want, you know, science or whatever it is, um, and so we sit across from a uh, you know, negotiator on the other side who's a better negotiator than we are, um, and we say, you know, we really need science, but we want to pay less for it, right? What's our plan B? Where, what's our negotiating leverage? Exactly zero, right? Um, so we need some form of plan B. I'm not sure that I know what the plan B is, but we need one, um, and we need it relatively soon. Um, there's a bigger picture plan B, though, um, which I really think is the open access movement. I was speaking with the dean of your pharmacy school earlier. I think this is, in, uh, uh, in effect, the most important thing that we could be doing as libraries in partnership with faculty and deans and provosts, because I think it will break a bad cycle, and it will get more access to more knowledge in the world at large. So the version we have undertaken at Harvard is to have a mandate um, in many of our schools, a mandate that says when we publish an article, we agree to make it open access as well as to publish it in other places. Um, it's an opt-out scheme. So let's imagine you want to publish something with a particular publisher and can't convince them. You can write to your dean and say, I'm opting out for this particular article. And you can say, I had peanut butter for breakfast. Doesn't matter your reason, it's just you get opted out immediately. But the presumption is every time you publish, you're making it available. So how do, does one do that? As a copyright lawyer, I'm interested in this, you may not be, um, but the notion is that the faculty member retains the copyright in the work entirely. Usually you give it away very quickly to the publisher. You say, no, I'm retaining it, and I will give two non-exclusive licenses out. One goes to Harvard, to my employer, and the other goes to the publisher. And the non-exclusive license says, you may publish it as you like, um, but you can't stop me from publishing it in this repository, in this online repository. So ours is called DASH, um, Digital Access to Scholarship at Harvard. Lots of people have others. I know um, URI has one. Um, but the model here is basically to say, yes, we want to publish it in these things, and absolutely, go make money from it. That's fine if a publisher wants to make money from it. But we are going to take a form of it, and we're going to put it on the internet and make it freely available, full stop. So um, this is something that is very much a work in progress. Um, we've made this pledge. Um, not as many faculty do it as should. Um, faculty haven't yet, I think, speaking for my own colleagues, um, gotten enough of the message that this is part of the workflow. Um, we haven't, I don't think, realized the difficulties associated with the serials crisis. If you pause and think about it, there's a closed loop here, more or less, right? We are the talent, right? We are, and the universities pay us um, to be the talent. Very often, we're the publishers. So in, in different fields, the universities are often associated with or, uh, or overseeing the publications, sometimes, of course, in the context of a commercial venture. And third, we're the buyers, right? We as libraries are the ones paying for it. We can break this cycle, but it will take an all-hands-on-deck effort, and we'll take all universities and all scholars standing together and saying, we're going to change this model, and it's going to be better for the world. Um, there are some potential downsides. We can get into that, but I don't think they are anywhere close to the importance and the benefit of this. Um, and I think even when you get to a granular level, and you've got a faculty member saying, I can't do that, I won't get promoted, or it's not as prestigious a journal, or whatever it might be um, in the system, one answer has to be the provost or the president or the dean has to stand up and say, you know what, it's going to be okay. You'll still get promoted, right? That we're looking at the quality of the work, we're not just using the proxy of the journal, and maybe we actually prefer you to do it, open access. In our particular case, now that we have the mandate, this is coming from the provost, this is something that the provost says, when we have you up for an ad hoc to determine whether you're going to get tenure, um, we may actually think this person's been an open access advocate, that's a good thing, not something that is something to be feared. So that's clearly one piece of it. Another one, though, is that I think there are empirical benefits to doing this. So just as an example, the most recent article I published, which was last Monday, um, was one about um, uh, kids and technology and how their parents uh, lie to get them on Facebook. So a majority of kids who are 12 in America are on Facebook, which is uh, the law disallows that, it turns out. Um, and we did a nationwide study, and the study showed that parents very often know and very often help kids do it. Okay? So we had this article to publish. And um, we published in an open access journal. Um, there were unbelievable benefits to doing this particular thing. So um, uh, one was it happened much more quickly. The open access journal had some reviewers on hand and was willing to turn it around. And if we had published this in you know, one of the very good communications journals or one of these other ones, it would be years before this was published, right? This is, but this is a survey done a few 
you know, maybe a month or so ago, and we wrote it up very quickly. This is, there's a pending law in Congress called CAPA, and that this is, bears on. And if we waited for some years to have this thing come out after peer review, it wouldn't have the impact that it would otherwise. The other one is, in day one, there were 7,000 downloads of this article, okay? So how, I mean, an actual download that you can count from discrete places, there, you know, no article that you publish in, even a prestigious journal is gonna get 7,000 downloads, you know, reads. That's presumably people actually looking at it and caring about it, right? And if you look at, I, th I expect that citations will follow suit, right? Is that more people are gonna be more likely to see and cite that article. So even at the granular level, this should be better for faculty. This should be better for us and we should want to do it. But it is totally crucial to this whole story we're talking about of visioning. Um, in addition to that though, I think we have to think about the learning process and the way in which we access and discover the scholarship. So it's plainly step one to get the scholarship up there. And I love also um, your statement number four about co-production, how libraries can be in the business of digital scholarship with, uh, with, uh, with scholars. Um, but imagine a world in which what we have instead of the sort of current publishing arrangement is we have a whole lot of these different repositories. So URI has its and Harvard has its and Dukes has its and so forth. Um, we have to think about how those get connected um, and also more so than just having them on the internet because that doesn't do enough. Um, one of the ways that that happens as a default, of course, is Google Scholar. So as we talk to graduate students, the way the default for them getting access to scholarship is not going to our um, library website and it's not going to our catalog. They start with Google Scholar in very large numbers, at least uh, in our world. Um, so Google Scholar connects all of these things. Um, I think there are benefits to that, but I also think that we in the library business should be in um, competition with Google in some ways. I'm not positive that we want to cede the poll position. We want to cede the position of being the gateway to all of this knowledge to a for-profit company. Um, I can get into my views on the Google Book settlement, which I think are is an important piece of this, but it would go down another rat hole. Um, but I think worrying about the role that one company has in being the gateway to all this knowledge is important. And to think about our role um, as universities in putting together this knowledge environment. Um, and I actually think libraries have a big uh, role to play. Um, so this may seem to be uh, a provocation that um, may not resonate, but let me try it anyway. Uh, one of the strategic approaches, in addition to open access, um, and jumping off this idea of being in sort of competition with Google is thinking seriously about the role that computer science and user interfaces and so forth have um, within libraries. I think we should be in the business of creating, um, as computer scientists do with computer scientists, in the libraries, better interfaces for getting at this content. So there are a bunch of reasons why this is so. One is, one thing the faculty tell us consistently at Harvard is, yeah, you buy all those electronic journals, but we can't find them. We have a very hard time locating them. And those kind of lists that we have of uh, journals, they don't work especially well. Um, so we're actually wasting money on a lot of those things. That's kind of one of the problems. Um, another one, though, is the very serious um, sort of response that people often have to the idea of a virtual library. So I suspect you've all experienced the lament that people have, which say, if you get rid of all these stacks, what will we lose? One of the things people always say is serendipity. You will lose the idea of serendipity, that you walk into a library stack and you had the call number, Dewey or LC or whatever, for that thing, and you're there and you're kind of having a nice time and looking at these and you think, oh my gosh, that's the one I needed. What an awesome one. And then by the end of it, of course, you're like stacked with seven books. You're like trying to make it out without dropping books. And it's embarrassing if you are the librarian too because you're dropping and mistreating the books. But in any event, the idea that we present knowledge in this way that actually leads to discovery and learning that you didn't expect, right? Okay, so is it plausible in a digital world to have that same idea? Um, so one of the projects we're working on in uh, my uh, library is um, the idea of virtual browsing. Other people are working on this too. Um, but it has, I think, a bunch of different features. One feature is that I think we can do uh, even better in some respects than the, um, the stacks in terms of figuring out how to arrange objects in a way that people will discover things that they didn't expect. So we can't replace the must and the smell and so forth of the stacks, of course, although you could try aromatherapy or something with that. Um, but I think what you could do is you can tap into the knowledge we have about libraries and the knowledge we have in libraries to present information in lots of different ways that users can choose. Um, so this image is one from our stack view idea, which is based on circulation. This is, again, meant by way of provocation, not as the answer. Um, we took the data from 2009 across Harvard University um, and we've created a thing called Library Cloud, which is a metadata server where lots of libraries can put, we can share this aggregated circulation data. 
Um, so the idea is to say, if someone were searching, in this case, um, for gravity's rainbow, um, what would they see? So they would see gravity's rainbow, and you can um, show how big the book is, right, based on um, this image. Um, but you can also give some hints about um, other books that are related to it. So one hint we've decided in this case was to show um, how many times did books like it, including the book you had, circulate, and by whom. So if you wanted, as a graduate student, to say, how many times has a graduate student checked out the books that I can see here in the last year? Or how many times have faculty members checked them out? Or how many people have faculty members in my discipline checked them out and so forth? You can have some hints as to other things you might like. So in this case, Mason and Dixon turns out to be the hot one, um, 108 on the circulation um, heat map. And of course, you can click and figure out what the algorithm is and how we weighted it. When things are on course reserve or when they've been recalled a lot, we use those data to give it higher scores. Um, presumably, then that could also lead to um, you know, better acquisitions uh, information on the other side. Um, there are lots of other ways to, um, to cut this, and you could give um, lots of different kinds of views of the stack. Um, but my sense is it doesn't have to be worse in the serendipity front in the digital era. In fact, it might be better in some respects. Um, we might have to relearn how to do it and so forth. It may require new skills. Um, the other advantage that this approach has over the physical approach, maybe in combination with the physical approach, is that um, in our case, we have 73 different libraries. There is no stack. We also have about half of our stuff at a depository 26 miles away, which is growing every day with modules. There's no stack. There's no place you can go and see all those books. And it's also infinite. It's pretty big, right? So this is a way. You could imagine a series of regional libraries coming together and saying, across Rhode Island, could you find this, right? Um, you could use this across big campuses. Or maybe you're collaborating with another university. Maybe Brown and URI do it together to show what's there, right? You could do lots of things with these visualizations um, that I think will lead to search and discovery. Um, OK. So uh, last of the. Um, kind of strategic areas that we're looking at um, is the idea of future mapping, which is plainly what you're doing here, too. Um, does anybody know what this image is of? Have they seen it? Yeah, print on demand. So this is called an espresso book machine. This is not futuristic. There is one in um, uh, a bookshop in our town. Um, this is a company based in New York called On Demand Books. And uh, it's a pretty neat thing, actually. It's about the size of a big Xerox machine. And the one in the bookstore in Harvard Square, if you go into it um, and you say to the um, uh, uh, computer there, I would like to call up a particular book, you type it in into a Google interface, and you pay $8 with your credit card. And three or four minutes later, you get a printed book. Just prints it right out. There are millions of titles available, all, lots of public domain stuff. And I did it the other day for an F. Scott Fitzgerald book. I wanted The Beautiful and Damned to read. And that you know, have 10 different versions of it that you can pick from with lots of different forewords and whatever. And a few minutes later, you have this printed book. OK, so why does this matter to libraries? Well, it could matter a whole lot to libraries in a whole lot of ways. Um, it's a huge competitive threat, potentially. Um, it could be a great friend. One might think about the ability to do just-in-time acquisitions, either to supplement or uh, to replace other forms of acquisitions. Um, it is obviously a little retrograde when we're talking about the digital, right? If you can get it immediately to somebody on their Kindle, um, uh, that's one way to think of this as maybe going to be overtaken by events very quickly. On the other hand, the way I think about it is that the materials, going back to my initial point, are born digital, right? So anybody who's writing a book right now is writing it on one of these, right? They're writing a Word document and giving it to their publisher. The publisher is then going to do a bunch of different things, right? One is print out a certain number of them and stick them in warehouses and hope that you're going to buy them as libraries or others. A middle thing they're going to do is to have it available print on demand, right? They're going to have the ability for somebody somewhere to be able to print it out quickly. It's much cheaper. They don't have to warehouse and so forth, right? On the other end of it, they will make it available for digital download on a Kindle or iPad immediately. If you think about this distribution model, where the thing is born digital and the fact that we print it out is sort of an artifact, it's because we want it in that format for some particular purpose, that may make us rethink a lot of these library operations. Now, I don't like the idea that it get, gets rid of the selectors, the bibliographers, that it gets rid of the acquisition staff, that it gets rid of the catalogers because it's all in you know, cataloging records, that it gets rid of all the people who kind of put the barcodes on stuff and shelve them and bind them and so forth. Um, but that's a possibility. That's a possibility, I think, of where we're going in this way. And I think the point is, in a way, we have to think about the affirmative argument for libraries. What is it that gets back to why we have these libraries in the first place if the point is not to be a storage warehouse for books, right? I think if we are hurtling toward a world 
in which what we think our job is is to have a bunch of books in here and help somebody have it when they want it, we're obsolete really, really soon. Uh, we need a different model for what libraries are. And yet I believe the need for libraries is greater than it's ever been. I think the complexity of finding information in this much more um, varied and much more rich and much more confusing information environment is crucial. Um, so I really think we have to go back to the model. What is the model for libraries that we want? How does it fit with the mission of the community? Um, this to me this is the image of the Boston Public Library at the front. Um, this says it all to me, the idea of free to all, right? That's the public library mission. That's not exactly the academic one, but that's a powerful statement. It basically says no matter who you are, you can come through these doors and get knowledge. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, whatever, right? We need a version of that story that fits for this digital age. We don't necessarily have it yet, um, and I think we have to do it with a mission-specific way. How does it support the teaching and learning for this university or for this town or um, for the special situation in, a, in the form of a state? Um, I think the answer here is not that we are headed toward a utopia. I don't think the point is that because of digital technologies, we will have the most wonderful, you know, everything in every way. On the other hand, I think the possibilities are huge for teaching and learning, very positive possibilities um, in terms of creativity, in terms of innovation, in terms of activism, um, but also just simply in terms of learning. Um, but I think in order to get there, we have to imagine what we want it to look like. We have to be in the business of designing it affirmatively. That's why I think your process of visioning for 2020 is exactly the right one. We have to put something up there, even though it's not going to be utopia. We need something that we are building toward affirmatively, and I think we have to do that in collaboration. I don't think that can be one institution saying this is the vision of a library. It needs to be this is an information ecosystem. This is the learning environment, the series of learning communities um, that we represent. And if we act more in concert, I think we'll be able to build one that is vastly better than the analog version and which can avoid many of the downsides that I think will be coming down the pike for libraries and for universities and others if we don't get in front of this mob and call it a parade. So with that, I think I will uh, end, if that's okay. We have a few minutes, I think. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Yes, ma'am.
what do you think about the notebooks in the room at Sweto Library at the University of Chicago, which they had to build because their faculty and their students in vast numbers said, no, 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 you cannot take these books off our campus. They have to be. Yeah. And that's an arts and sciences, not a yeah. um, So you're right. The second one is uh, you know, sort of internal politics. It's you know, how do you think about the what should be in a space. Um, Christian Academy, as you well know, had a similar kind of experience. I think it just sort of getting rid of books broadly is just feels anti-intellectual somehow to me. It doesn't seem like it's sort of missing the point, right? The, the point here is we need to create a learning environment going forward that's good. People right now are learning with different things. We've got to figure out how to have that variation within this. It's a hybrid moment. It's a hybrid moment. It's neither analog nor digital. It's digital plus in my view. Um, so to your harder question. I take it in a way to be what's the future of technical services or what's the future of cataloging or um, could we get along without cataloging, which may be the way in which the budget cutter sort of asks the question. Um, and uh, so well, point one is um, my view is that catalogers and people in technical services need to get better at being advocates for what they do. I think that catalogers have had a very hard time making the case for um, levels of metadata creation and use. Um, Frankly, in my own library, when I have um, adjusted standards, let's put it that way, which is to say brought them down, um, and I'll describe why if you want, um, the people who have fought back most aggressively are the reference librarians, exactly as you suggested. So the people who fight back against me when I say we don't need the gold plus, 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 plus version because we can't afford it, version of cataloging, the reference people say absolutely we do, and here's why. And actually, often they have very good reasons, right? Um, so I don't think you're invoking this as a head of reference is unusual at all. I think it's just right. You're the ones who actually are making the better case for the need for metadata. Okay, so the reality is that this is plainly an area that lots of people are cutting. Um, I'm quite confident that um, as any review happens across a big university system, people will say, can we do with less cataloging? Why? The things that are visible to the patrons are the people out at ref desks and the people at circ desks and whatever, and the people who have the direct relationships with the powerful people, like the faculty who become provosts and faculty who become deans, tend to be the reference people, right? So there is a built-in issue there, and it's, there's a huge pressure on it. Um, okay, so uh, what will happen? With less metadata, you're quite right that there will be less good search and discovery mechanisms, right? There, there will be some diminution of that, I think. Um, but I don't think it's all badness. So here's one reason. I think if we think quite differently about how the cloud functions as it develops, that there may be a way for us to be more collaborative than we've been in the past. Now, does anybody here work for OCLC? I'm about to say something bad about OCLC. <laughs> okay. So the idea that our structure has been to share materials with a well-meaning institution and a great institution initially, um, but in a way that disallows us to um, share it truly, to have it in an open cloud-based way, to me is preposterous at this moment. So I actually think that if we are able to have the idea of the library cloud that I mentioned before, where we in fact share metadata much more openly, I think the next big movement is not just open access to the scholarship, but open access to the metadata, right? And we actually get scholars and other people in on the act of working with catalogers and, and you know amending it and adding to it and so forth. I think that movement will help solve this problem. I don't think it completely solves the problem. It doesn't get rid of the need to do good cataloging. It just means we can do it more efficiently than we have. I may be wrong. It seems like part of it is also that you have to be taught or individuals have to understand why, why, why that difference matters. Mm -hmm. Why does it matter to have this version and not that version? Um, and to be able to, you know, use your mind to recognize that, oh, I'm, deal I'm not dealing with what I thought I, you know, I don't have here what I thought, what I was expecting. So there's this kind of basic pedagogical my question, which is, and you opened up, and I thought it was very interesting about talking about the socio-economic skew in yeah. terms of digital, digital literacy. And um, what I'm wondering is, is there a way that you know of that university, at the university levels, there's a way, you know, like, you know, I'm thinking back, you know, when I went into school, I would need to sign up for French. Well, do you take a French test to see, you know, how good are you? Do you yes. take French 101, or can you go into the second year already? Is there a kind of equivalent? Are there evaluative tools that universities can use to judge where their students are at so they can pitch the teaching to the right level? Because if you require every yeah. student to take, let's say, a, liter a library information science class, I think yeah. it's a great idea. But the students who are more sophisticated are going to be bored, and the students who are less sophisticated are going to be lost, and you're kind of losing on both, you're losing them on both ends. Yeah. And so is there a way to kind of filter, filter that? Or? So, I have a 
actually never heard it asked quite in that way, so I want to think more about it, but it's a wonderful concept, and I love the link between the learning that's happening and back to cataloging. Completely agree that if you can build that link, that's the fundamental piece, right? If, in fact, we're undermining our ability to serve the teaching and learning mission of the university, we're kaput, right? So anything that breaks that link is crucial to um, understand. Now, catalogers have to be careful not to overstate the link, and we have to figure out really what's necessary, but I think it's a really, really important insight. In terms of the um, teaching programs and the literacy, I've never seen a university do it. It doesn't mean it hasn't been done. We certainly don't do it. Um, but one possible answer to it, to think about the fact that you don't want a one-size-fits-all version of this, very importantly, the skew is very, very broad, um, is to think about the ability that we're um, starting to develop across different learning platforms where you can have, take an iPad app or a, um, an online system that is very quickly diagnostic and then allows you to um, uh, make harder questions for um, kids who need harder questions and less hard questions for kids who um, need more basic questions. This is a really simple idea that is bubbling up through the K-12 to system, right? Because we have this huge problem of do you do tracking, do you do differentiation, how do you kind of meet the needs in a big, huge public school environment? I don't see why that same principle doesn't apply to your problem, right? Why isn't it an iPad app or it's a, even the iPad app could be diagnostic, even if you, the iPad app were not then the thing that scaffolded out. But I actually think the scaffolding is exactly what we should do. So that you um, have to pass through this in order to get you know, to the other side of it. And if you are really advanced, great, you're gonna get some really cool advanced stuff, and of course you'll pass, but you actually might get stretched. And if you're really in a tough spot, um, you know, it'll bring you a little bit along and maybe it'll flag it for, you know, a librarian or someone else who could help. I think it's a wonderful idea. I haven't heard it before. Yes, uh, I'm dean of the library. Oh, wonderful. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're an important person in any event, in my view. The, uh, I have seen the library become more social space uh, than in looking at the students using their computers, they're, they're doing social things. They're not looking at my uh, journals. They're not looking at articles that I can see. Uh, yes, they do, but I mean, the, the, the whole concept of the library is a social space. Do you see it undermining the presence of the library as a center for research? and therefore making the administration think that this is space rather than supporting the elements for acquisitions, uh, information literacy, or having librarians <coughs> go out and cluster with a teaching faculty. Is this social impinging on the research? I don't happen to think it is. Um, so th but this is something absolutely debatable. This is complete just personal opinion. I actually think anything that gets students into a library space and has them, you know, even if it's because they're going to be next to one another, I think that's probably always been true to some extent that it's a social experience of sitting next to somebody studying. The fact that, of course, I see them on Facebook and so forth as I go by, as well as reading journals, um, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. If this is a vibrant environment in which people want to come and they want to be there, and yes, some of the time they're studying and some of the times they're slacking off. Now, there's a separate problem which is students need to multitask or switch tasks less than they do, right? So we need to help students understand that they will get through their homework, and frankly, faculty will write their books faster if they're not multitasking while they're doing it or switch tasking, which is the real thing. Um, so uh, that's a really fundamental learning issue. Um, but to your bigger question, no, bring them in. Uh, to me, it's great. I agree that we want to bring them in. Yeah. It's been very powerful. I can't believe the transition. And we don't have a, a, a table that stays in place more than three minutes, yep. and, and they brought it together. Yep. But yep. my point is, if if they look at the library purely as social, and and think the librarian in that environment isn't out working or assisting the research faculty or teaching the students how to do research, then the library has lost its value in the academic environment. If that's encouraged too. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's the fact that the teachers shouldn't be embedded with librarians and vice versa out in the community, but I don't know, I guess I don't see them as mutually exclusive, but I, I think it's, it seems to me a very important political question to ask among other things. Yeah. The, the idea of the library being used for social purposes is probably slightly misconstrued. You have to realize that today, as in the sciences, learning is collaborative. And I am an observer of student use of libraries as well as a researcher. And these kids are plugged in with their computers. They're 
four of them together, four computers open, and they are attacking a given study problem together because they, each kid brings a different insight. And I was, or I was quite impressed. This is one day last week at the URI library. Um, the other, and, and it's important to keep that in crucial. The, I mean, that's critical yeah. because people in the sciences know they don't work alone. They're working, their work is global. The people they're collaborating with can be any place, China or Switzerland. The other important point it concerns the skills required for the new library format. And you've seen the redesign both here at URI and Brown, which is a library I use quite frequently. And I discovered that the new skill required of librarians is, and he's my key man, uh, is an engineering student who specialized in warehouse operations. Mm -hmm. Because these books are warehouse. Now, Dewey and LC are still very important because that's the basis of the, yeah. of the, of the barcode, but there's another thing in there. You've got a, a warehouse environmentally controlled. Right, and we do it by uh, size. 30 feet, the stack is 30 yeah. feet high, yeah. so the librarian hasn't devolved <laughs> there's a crane. All right. Yeah. The books are not arranged in yeah. the order you're used right. to. They're in thins. Yep. And the barcode, the barcode tells you what thin. What thin is it? What, what aisle? What stack? And what thin? All I can say to those two is amen. They're both and right. The so might this gentleman has had his hand up for so long. Can I ask okay, one yeah. more? And one more. Will, will yeah. Forgive me? Yeah. One yes, sir. This is arm is tired, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Could you talk about more collaborative use of information ecosystems on campus and what would possibly be the reality of maybe using RFIDs for the books that are in the library? Yeah, so I, I, um, I'm teaching a class on library design um, with a, a design school professor at the GSD and a student yesterday presented a proposal for RFIDs and her idea was that you stick an RFID chip in every book. I thought and, you had well you can of course do it and that then you had a, a little um, device with the reader on it and if you're walking around and you're trying to find where the book was and they walk into a cafe you can kind of track them. Oh there's my book! <laughs> <laughs> I think someone's backpack. You can imagine just like opening up the backpack and there's my book right there. Um, so uh, there are lots of visions of this. I think that's a little scary for privacy reasons. Yeah. <laughs> also stalking and other reasons. Um, but I actually think it's along the right track, um, which is for exactly the, the, your first point, which is we are teaching affirmatively people to work in teams. It's a good idea, right? And it is plainly, we do it across disciplines now, we design classes in this way. I think libraries can track to that, right? Can be yeah. supporting that in explicit ways. I, I know I've gotten the hook here from Gail um, a minute ago, but I, I just think that's a wonderful provocation to put on the table for these four things, was how do libraries support that kind of interdisciplinary work in kind of a social mode across these different school boundaries. I think it's a it's a great problem to work on. Anyway, thank you so much for the chance to be here. I'm really sorry to cut this short, but I know that Dr. Palfrey um, took time out from an